chapter 2, 6 through 20. I'm going to start in the middle of verse 6. Woe to him who piles up stolen goods and makes himself wealthy by extortion. How long must this go on? Will not our debtors suddenly arise? Will they not wake up and make you tremble? Then you will become their victim. Because you have plundered many nations, the peoples who are left will plunder you. For you have shed man's blood, you have destroyed lands and cities and everyone in them. Woe to him who builds his realm by unjust gain, to set his nest on high, to escape the clutches of ruin. You have plotted the ruin of many people, shaming your own house and forfeiting your life. The stones of the wall will cry out, and the beams of the woodwork will echo it. Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and establishes a town by crime. Has not the Lord Almighty determined that the people's labor is only fuel for the fire, that the nations exhaust themselves for nothing? For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the God, of the Lord. As the waters cover the sea, Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbors, pours it from the wineskin till they are drunk, so that he can gaze on their naked bodies. You will, you will be filled with shame instead of glory. Now it is your turn. Drink and be exposed. The cup from the Lord's right hand is coming around to you, and disgrace will cover your glory. The violence you have done to Lebanon will overwhelm you, and your destruction of animals will terrify you. For you have shed man's blood. You have destroyed the lands, you have destroyed lands and cities, and everyone in them. Of what value is an idol, since a man has carved it, or an image that teaches lies? For he who makes for he who makes it trusts in his own creation. He makes idols that cannot speak. Woe to him who says to wood, come to life, or to lifeless stone, wake up, can they give guidance? It is covered with gold and silver, there is no breath in it. But the Lord is in his holy temple, let all the earth be silent before him. Moses to lead the Israelites 
uh, out of the land of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. And Moses led them for 40 years in the wilderness. And near the end of Moses' life, he's on the border of the promised land. He's, he's on the other side of the Jordan River, and he's about to die. But he gives a message uh, to the Israelites in, uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 28, uh, and he tells them of the blessings that there will be if you obey God and the curses that will come upon you if you disobey God. And when Moses finished that long sermon, he said, This day I have set before you life and death, <coughs> blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live. Moses' successor was Joshua, and Joshua was a great warrior who brought the Israelites into the Promised Land. And as you read the book of Joshua, in three swift, decisive battles, uh, Joshua and the Israelites conquered the whole land of Canaan. And Joshua also had a worship service celebrating the, the conquest. And in, in Joshua 24, he said, and this, this, this worship service was held at the city of Shechem, which were, where there once stood a huge altar to Baal, the Canaanite storm god. And at this worship service, at the conclusion, uh, Joshua said, choose this day who you are going to serve. Whether it's the gods beyond the river where your ancestors lived, or whether it's the gods in this land where you now dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. There's a choice. Follow the ways of the world or follow the ways of God. In the New Testament, the Apostle John uh, tells us the same thing. Uh, he says in 1 John uh, chapter 2, verse 15 and 17, Do not love the world or the things that are in the world, for the things of this world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, they are of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof. But whoever does the will of God shall abide forever. You have a choice to make. Choose life or choose death. Choose the ways of God or choose the ways of this world. So we've been on a journey the past few weeks looking at the prophet Habakkuk, and most of the scholars believe that Habakkuk wrote his work somewhere between 608 and 605 BC. And Habakkuk, like all of the great prophets, asks the heavy questions. You know, why is there so much evil in our world, God? Where are you? Why do righteous people suffer? How long is this going to go on? But as, as we read through the three chapters of Habakkuk, we see um, him taking us on a journey, taking us on a journey from worry to worship, taking us on a journey from fear to faith. And like Moses, and like Joshua, and like the Apostle John, Habakkuk holds out two ways in which we can live our life. Do we want to follow the ways of the world, or do we want to follow uh, the ways of God? And so as Habakkuk writes this in, in chapter 1, we, we learn about the nation of Judah and the chaos it was in. Judah had been around for 350 years. For 10 generations, there had been a descendant of King David on the throne. Solomon's glorious temple was the centerpiece of, of this great nation. But the nation was divided, polarized. It was filled with violence. Lawmakers were unable to make laws. The courts weren't, uh, uh, weren't giving any, sort, any sense of justice. And Habakkuk again is asking those questions. Why is this happening? And uh, God, God answered in chapter 1, verse 5. He said, and it wasn't an answer that Habakkuk wanted to hear. He said, stand by. I'm going to raise up Babylon. 
the curses of God are about to come on you because you've been disobedient, disobedient to God, and I'm going to raise up Babylon as an instrument of punishment. And, and Habakkuk complains again. Why, God? I mean, they're worse than we are. They're more wicked than we are. How come you're using them? Aren't we your chosen people? Aren't we the ones you led out of Egypt and brought to the promised land? Didn't you call us a, a holy nation, a royal priesthood? How can you allow this to happen? Can you see yourself asking these questions? Why is there so much gun violence in the streets of the United States of America? Why are opioid drugs killing the young people all over the place? Why can't our Congress make any laws and agree on a budget? Where is the justice in our, our court systems? Um, why is all this sex trafficking? Why is the United States always involved in a war somewhere? Why is there terrorism all around the world? Heavy questions. Heavy, heavy questions. Eternal questions. Why, why, why? Habakkuk was pretty smart. He said, I'm okay, I've got that off my chest. I've got that all out. In chapter 2, if you were here last week, uh, in chapter 2, verse 1, he says, I'm going to stand the watch. I'm going to look and see what God has to say to me. I'm going to go to my prayer closet, closet and be quiet, and maybe God will speak. And God did speak to Habakkuk. He gave him a vision of the future. He said, write this down so it can be passed on uh, to future generations. And the vision is this. The just will live by faith. Trust God through all the chaos of our lives. Don't forsake your faith. Believe in the true and the living God. And it's easy to do when things are going well. It's easy to say, I love God, I love Jesus when things are going well. But when, when times are hard, that's when, that's when faith is most important of all. There's an old hymn that says, life is easy when you're up on the mountain and you've got peace of mind like you've never known. But things change when you're down in the valley. Don't lose faith, for you're never alone. For the God on the mountain is still God in the valley. When things go wrong, he'll make them right. And the God of good times is still God in the bad times. The God of the day is still the God of the night. Amen? Amen. Amen. So as we look at these verses today, uh, verses 6 through 20, um, Habakkuk lays out two paths. You can follow the way of Babylon and what God is about to do to Babylon, and, and Babylon is a symbol of the world. Babylon is a symbol of nations or people that turn their back on God. Or you can follow the ways of God. And we're going to see this in these, uh, these verses 6 through 20. Uh, he begins with what's going to happen to Babylon. Uh, and, he, and there are five woes in this text. Whoa, 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 whoa. I mean, that's bad news when you get, when you get five woes thrown at you. The, the first woe is in verse 6. Look at, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, verse 6. Woe to him who piles up stolen goods and makes himself wealthy by extortion. This is something the nation of Babylon was doing. Uh, woe to those who practice extortion. Have you ever been scammed on the internet? Have you ever had ransomware all of a sudden hits your computer, you're standing there at the computer and the whole thing crashes and this phone number flashes up and says, you need to call this number right away in order to get your computer back online. And, uh, and you call the number and you talk to some strange voice and they want all this money to get your computer online. You're being scammed. You're being extorted. And, and, and the Lord is saying, woe to those who practice such a thing. A, a few years ago, my dad, when he was still alive, he was in his 90s, and he got a telephone call, and the, te and the voice on the telephone said, your grandson has had an automobile accident in New York City. 
and his car is, is impounded, and he needs some money to get the car out of the, out of the impound lot. And uh, my dad was still sharp in his 90s. He said, okay, what's his sister's name? And they hung up. <laughs> he, he detected a scam. He detected woe to those who practice extortion. The second woe is in verse 9. Woe to him who builds his house by unjust gain, setting his nest on high to escape the clutches of ruin. You have plotted the ruins of, of many people, and uh, shaming your own house and forfeiting your life. And, and uh, this is something the nation of Babylon was doing, uh, building houses by unjust gain. In fact, let me tell you a little bit about ancient Babylon. Uh, the Greek historian Herodotus uh, said that Babylon was a city 15 miles square. And they had walls made of bricks, and they find these bricks all over with Nebuchadnezzar's name on them, all over the ancient Middle East. Um, uh, the walls were 100 feet high, and they were 87 feet wide. They used to drive six chariots abreast on top of those walls. The city was crisscrossed by 25 major avenues, 150 feet wide. In underneath, check this out, underneath the Euphrates River, there were brass banqueting halls. All of brass underneath the room. You talk about technology. In the city of Babylon, there were two of the seven wonders of the ancient world: uh, the, the hanging, the hanging gardens of Babylon, and the Tower of Baal. Again, the Canaanite uh, god of thunder and lightning. And this, this was all built by Nebuchadnezzar in 42 years' time, the great king. It was built on the back of slavery, it was built by bloodshed, and it was, it was uh, built by plundering all of the nations around it. Woe, woe, woe to those who would do this. So this, this second woe, woe to verse 9, woe to him who builds his house by unjust gain. Um, in 1939, Adolf Hitler turned 50 years old. And the Nazi party in Germany decided to uh, give him a, a birthday gift. And it was a house built high in the mountains called Eagle's Nest. It cost uh, $273 million to build. But it was built on bloodshed. And uh, what goes around comes around. And Hitler didn't spend much time in Eagle's Nest. He ended up dying ignominiously in a bunker in, in, in Berlin. Woe, woe, woe to those who build their house by unjust gain. The, the, the third woe is found in verse 12. Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and establishes a town by injustice. The whole, this glorious city of Babylon was built by bloodshed. Woe to those who built cities that way. There was a mobster in the, 19, in the early 1900s his name was Bugsy Siegel. Anybody heard of Bugsy yeah. Siegel? And Bugsy was a weapons trafficker, you know, made tons of money selling guns and illegal things. And he, he was a murderer, murdered a lot of people, and uh, absconded with all kinds of money, ripped people off and scams. In the 1940s, he came to Las Vegas, and he said, this would be a good place to have a few casinos. And the Strip was established in Las Vegas by Bugsy Siegel. In 1947, Bugsy Siegel was assassinated, uh, and they never found out who did. What goes around comes around. You don't build cities by bloodshed and, and crime. Woe, woe, woe to those who do that. Verse 15 is the fourth woe. Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbor pouring it from the wineskins until they're drunk so that he can gaze on their naked bodies. Uh, verse uh, 16 says, Now it's your turn. Drink and let your nakedness be exposed. The cup from the Lord's right hand is coming around to you. Uh, the disgrace will cover your glory. Uh, I, I would tremble if I was in the pornography business today, abusing women and children 
you know, plying and probably with all kinds of alcohol and, and drugs in order to in order to appeal to the prurient interests of, of those who would spend their time looking at such material. I would tremble in fear for uh, for those who are in the sex trafficking uh, business today. You know, the, the United States is a horrible place for sex sex trafficking teenagers sold into bondage. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Who, to those who do such things. Justice is coming. Justice is coming right around the corner. And finally, the fifth wall was mentioned in verse 19. Verse 18 says, Of what value is an idol carved by a craftsman, or an image that teaches lies? For the one who makes it trusts his own creation. He makes idols that cannot speak. Woe to him that says to wood, come to life, or to lifeless stone. Wake up, can it give guidance? Well, we create idols today that can speak. Isn't that incredible? Hello, Siri. <laughs> Tell me who I should worship. Tell me how I should run my life. You know, and I'm not making fun of cell phones. They're incredible things. But when your life is totally dominated by this, and, there, and you have no other existence, uh, you've ignored God. Whoa, whoa, whoa to you. So, Siri, be quiet. <laughs> but a lot of woes are being pronounced on Babylon, the, the most glorious city probably that ever existed. Whoa, 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 whoa. What goes around comes around, and you're going down. That's not very exciting, is it? This applies personally, as well as to cities, as well as to nations. It applies to us. But with this bad news with these curses, uh, God breaks through with good news. And we see it in the text. Uh, three times these, this system of woes is broken up by a piece of good news. The first one is verse 11. The stones of the walls will cry out. The beams of the woodwork will echo it. All of creation knows when there's injustice. And, and, and even the stones cry out. When I first read that, I thought about uh, Palm Sunday coming up. March 24th, coming up pretty soon. Palm Sunday was when Jesus revealed himself to the world, who he really was. He was the king of heaven that had, had made an amphibious landing on this planet and it was about to take back the kingdoms of this world and claim them for the kingdom of God. And uh, Jesus, when he walked from the Mount of Olives to the city of Jerusalem on, on Palm Sunday, there were thousands and thousands of people. Hosanna! Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And, and the religious establishment who were of the worldly system were furious. And they said, teacher, tell your, tell your disciples to be quiet. And Jesus looked at him and said, even if they were quiet, the stones would cry out. You know, so all of creation knows when there's injustice and when there's oppression. Uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. often talked about how the, the, uh, the arc of the universe is aimed towards, towards justice. So the next uh, passage of hope in the middle of all this is verse 14. It says, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as waters cover the sea. This Jesus who came to Jerusalem, uh, well actually, if you read Isaiah 11 sometimes, you can do that on your own. Isaiah 11 uh, talks about the glory of the Lord covering the earth. And, and as you read Isaiah 11, it says it's going to be a descendant of Jesse who, who makes this happen. And Jesse, of course, was the great-grandfather of King David. And Jesus is a descendant of King David. And when Jesus... And, and, and descendant of, of Jesse would slay the wickedness of the world. We read that in Isaiah 11. So as Jesus came to the streets of Jerusalem on Palm Sunday and the crowds erupted recognizing who he was, Jesus later went to the cross and he died for our sins in the streets of Jerusalem. And he slayed the wicked in that, in that action. And what was the wicked? The wicked was, was our sin. The wickedness was death. The wickedness was hell. The wickedness was the devil. Jesus 
died for all of the wickedness of the world. He drank from the cup of wrath that, that we deserve to drink from. Uh, and, and, and Jesus died for all that and destroyed it all by rising from the dead. He rose from the dead three days later, and he ascended into heaven, and he's coming back again. And, and the knowledge of the glory of God has been spread to every nation on the face of the earth. Every nation in this world, there's a Christian presence. Uh, somebody in every country knows, knows about Jesus, uh, the Son of God, the, the Savior of the world. So th this is tremendous hope. Even in the midst of all of the woes that were being preached against Babylon, uh, God is extending hope. Uh, the, the earth will be filled with the knowledge and glory of the Lord as waters cover the sea. And then the last little snippet of hope is verse 20. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. In times of chaos, in times of trouble, God is still there. He's in his holy temple. Uh, and uh, I love uh, Psalm 73, if you'd like to turn there. Uh, look, at, look at Psalm 73. Uh, I'll read a few verses from it. But Psalm 73 begins with, Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold. For I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. Verse 8 says, They scoff and speak with malice. With arrogance they threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven. Their tongues take possession of the earth. Verse 12 says, This is what the wicked are like. Always free of care. They go on amassing wealth. Surely in vain I've kept my heart pure. I've washed my hands in innocent. All day long I have been afflicted. Every morning brings new punishments. Verse 16, when I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply until I entered the sanctuary of God. And then I understood their final destiny. Surely he will place them on slippery ground and cast them to ruin. How suddenly they are destroyed completely swept away by terrors. The Lord is in his holy temple. He sees these things, and he will balance the scales. That's the promise of Habakkuk, and that's the promise uh, throughout Scripture. I spent five years of my life as a surface warfare officer in the, in the United States Navy in my, in my early 20s. And a surface warfare officer has an incredible amount of responsibility. I was the officer of the deck of naval vessels uh, underway. I was responsible for the safe navigation of ships, responsible for making sure that the ships met all of their commitment and you know, completed all of their missions. Heady stuff for somebody in their early, early 20s. But as an officer of the deck on a naval ship, uh, there was one spot that was, you could call it holy ground. It was this big, plush, comfortable chair. It's on, it's on the deck of, of every, it's on the bridge of every naval ship. And it's called the captain's chair. And as officers of the deck, uh, only one who can sit in is the commanding officer of the ship. If you ever sat in it, man, you'd be, you'd be court-martialed. That's the captain's chair, only the captain's chair. And so as junior officers like myself would stand to watch, four hours straight, you know, binoculars around your head, scanning the horizon, uh, and, and, and you saw that empty chair over there, and, and you knew, you knew you were under somebody else's authority. You know, you had a lot of power as an officer in the deck, but you were, there, there was somebody that was far greater than you. And sometimes being an officer of the deck of a ship at sea can get pretty hectic, can, can get pretty chaotic. You know, there might be some terrible storms, and, 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 the, and the, the ship is at peril. I've, I've been through a few hurricanes on ships. Uh, there might be uh, heavy traffic in narrow shipping lanes, hundreds of ships going in and out, and you're terrified. You make one little shift in the rudder, and you're going to have a collision with somebody. Or there might be enemy combatants nearby. And it can get kind of terrifying for an officer of the deck. And if it, if it gets too heavy, 
you know, the officer in the deck always knows I can always call the captain uh, to come to the bridge. And uh, when, when you do that, as soon as the commanding officer sets foot on, on the bridge, uh, the boats are made of the watch, cries out, Captain's on the bridge! And the, and, and the old man, that's what we always called the captain, the old man would take his seat in that big comfortable chair. And there was, your, there was the best sailor of all on the ship. There was the finest warrior of all on the ship. And all the problems seemed to go away with the wisdom of that, of that commanding officer. Ladies and gentlemen, the captain's on a bridge. <laughs> you know, no matter how rough and how difficult times may be, uh, the Lord is in his holy temple. That's why we worship. That's why worship is so important. On Sunday morning, we need to we need to remember that as we live our lives out in the world. The captain's on the bridge. Uh, the Lord is in His holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent before Him. What goes around comes around. Uh, Babylon, which had plundered so many nations for so many years, the year was 539 B.C., and you can read about it in the book of Daniel, uh, chapter five. Belshazzar was the king, and he was sitting with his wives and with his concubines and with all the royal noble officials. He was sitting in one of those brass banqueting halls underneath the Euphrates River, and they were drinking wine from goblets that were plundered from the temple in Jerusalem. And they were praising the gods of gold and silver and stone. When all of a sudden, the handwriting came on the wall. This is where we get this expression. The handwriting's on the wall. And, and Belshazzar saw the words of the handwriting on the wall. And I like the way the King James Version puts it. His knees began to smoke together. He was, he was terrified as he saw this. And the words said, nay, 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 take old parson. And he had no idea what that meant. He just saw the words all of a sudden appear on the wall. And he, he remembered Daniel the prophet. And he called in Daniel. And Daniel came into the brass banqueting hall. And he looked at the king. And he said, here's the interpretation of those words. God has numbered the days of your reign. You have been found wanting in the balances. Your kingdom is now divided. It's given to the Medes and to the Persians. And we read both in the Bible and in secular history that that very night the armies of the Persians came underneath the walls of, of Great Babylon and conquered the city and Babylon was destroyed and it has never again been rebuilt. And throughout history, Babylon has been a symbol of those who would take a position against God. But throughout history, Babylon has been a symbol of those who would refuse to believe in God and follow the ways of this world. I don't need God in my life. If you look at Revelation chapter 17, the Apostle John talks about mystery Babylon. And uh, Revelation 17, he talks about verse 3, An angel carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and there I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names, had seven heads and ten horns. This was Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. Uh, chapter 18, verse 2 says, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. She has become a dwelling for demons. Uh, in Revelation uh, 18, verse Verse 9, woe, woe, woe to you, great city, you mighty city of Babylon. In one hour, your doom has come. Then it says in verse 21, a mighty angel picked up a boulder the size of a large millstone and threw it into the sea. With such violence, the great city of Babylon will be thrown down, never to be found again. So this is what Habakkuk is telling us. There's, there's two ways to live your life. You can follow the way of Babylon and ignore God and be ready for the judgment. Or you can follow the way of God, which is the way of faith. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. 
What must I do to be saved? This is a question that was posed to Jesus in John chapter 6. And Jesus said, believe. Believe on the one that God has said, sent. This is the message of Habakkuk. It's by faith that you are saved. And this is a message that we find throughout the scripture. So the stones cry out the glory of God. The whole earth is covered with the knowledge of the glory of God. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let the whole earth be silent before him. He loves you. You are his child. Uh, choose this day whom you're going to serve. But as for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. So back with the prophet. Two more, two more thoughts, two more weeks to go on the back. Lots, still lots of more, a lot more nuggets to mine. But any uh, thoughts, any, any comments uh, for you? So where is Babylon located today? It's in, it's in Iraq. And uh, it's, it's ruins. You know, it's never been rebuilt. So literally and figuratively, this is, this is true. Tom. Sometimes I feel like a When you think about the fact that what's going on in the country, you yeah. know, the government, and say, how can this be happening? Yeah. And uh, you yeah. answer the question today. Yeah. Good. 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 And uh, we have to have that faith. Yeah. Do our best. Keep your faith. Anybody else? Thoughts? Comments? We're um, going to celebrate communion together today. So if our elders would come up and our, and our uh, deacons prepare the elements. <laughs> We're told to uh, examine ourselves as we come to the Lord's table. And often we read uh, the Apostles' Creed together, a statement of faith. But I, I want to do that this morning. I want to, I want to pray, and I, I want you to pray with me. Uh, so please close your eyes, and I want you to think deeply about your life and about your soul. Are you on the right path? Are you on the way that's following God, or are you on the way that's following the things of this world? Uh, you may come to church every Sunday. You may be in a small group. You may celebrate communion with us today, but that doesn't save you. It's faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, that saves you. And you need to personally make that decision. You can't say, my father believed, or my wife believed, or my grandfather was a deacon. It's you that have to make that decision. Is there anybody here that has not accepted Christ and needs to make that decision today? Slip your hand up if anybody's here that needs to make that decision. Lord, thank you for being our King and being our God. Thank you for laying down your life for us on the cross, defeating those enemies of the soul. Thank you for rising from the dead, shattering the power of sin and death and hell. Thank you for the promise that you're coming back again uh, to, to make all things new. So may we keep the faith, Lord, as we live in this world. May we be in this world, but not of this world. May we keep our eyes on you in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 If you'd like to participate in uh, communion today, please uh, take the elements as they're passed out to you. And I guess we do have time to read the Apostles' Creed as the elements are being passed out. So. Uh, please join me to find it in your program, an ancient statement of faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. 
I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the last. Amen. On the night that uh, Jesus was betrayed, he took the cup and he blessed it. I'm sorry, he took, he took bread and broke it. I got ahead of myself here. He took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, broken for you. David, would you lead us in prayer for the bread? Oh, no, I'm doing the bread. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. That's the done. Bread, yeah. That's the done. <laughs> Father, I'm reminded of the fact that even one of your own disciples is mm -hmm. you. And Father, even the disciples that were with you at the end, all the are deserted you. But the Heavenly Father, your Heavenly Father in heaven, never deserted you. And Father, you went to the cross honoring him and following what you would want, what he would want you to do. And he went to the cross knowing that Father, that only you would be with him in that sin. Father, we thank you, Father, that you've allowed Jesus to go to the cross, to take away our sin, to allow us, Father, to have a life a new life with you. And we thank you so much for what you have done for us. And we thank you, Father, that we get an opportunity to reach out to you in faith and make a great trust in doubting heaven. And Father, you're going to take care of us. You're going to guide us. You're going to lead us. And you're going to help us. And we thank you for all that you are about to do in our lives. And you've already done in the past. In Jesus' name.
coming and joining us for worship today. It's uh, one short hour on Sunday morning. It goes by so quickly. But there are some tremendous opportunities for serving God throughout the week. Uh, Pastor Tom has a Tuesday night Bible study at his house. We've got a Wednesday night Bible study right here. Uh, there's a Thursday night Bible study. Uh, Barry leads one here at the church. Uh, there's a music fellowship. Uh, we have people helping with Tri-City Pantry every week. Uh, so uh, people stepping up to leadership positions. So let me encourage you to, to do more, do a little bit more than just one hour on Sunday morning. Jump in there. Of course, live your life in a way that honors God uh, throughout the week. We're uh, thrilled to have uh, Jeff Ross in the house. Come on down, Jeff. Jeff's uh, uh, we, 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 one of the ministries we support, Urban Youth Collaborative. Uh, works with the young people throughout North County. And I'd like you to offer the benediction. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Um, just from even the angry. 